like to welcome Hina Sharma. Hina is a software quality techno quality technologist working with IBM. With her experience of 18 years in testing, she brings her expertise in varied domains like investment banking, messaging, development platforms in private and high. She would be conducting a lab session on testing in the cloud, deploy and debug an application deployment on OpenShift. To know more about her and to see a video interview, please check out the link below. We are very happy to have you here with us and cannot wait to hear from you about testing in cloud. You may now present your screen now. Okay, sure. Thanks, sir. Hearing is enabled. Uh, it's not enabled, sorry. Uh, let me, okay. You should be having uh, uh, the right to share. Give me a minute. I will have people to give you the course right. Let me check. Okay. Hello. No. Okay, give me a minute. I have Okay, uh, till the time we start and I have the sharing enabled. Um, uh, hello everyone, I am Hina Sharma and as, as uh, Ravi just uh, uh, updated my introduction that I'm working with IBM and I have experience of over two decades now into testing, um, worked in investment banking, messaging, and currently, I'm, I'm working on an enterprise product uh, where it's an, a private cloud as well as hybrid cloud. Um, and um, we are using OpenShift as one of the platforms uh, in the product. So this, this lab is basically for, for everyone who would like to understand what's OpenShift. It's, it's mainly an introductory sort of a lab uh, where you, know, you get your hands on, on the OpenShift. Uh, we will talk about what is OpenShift, why OpenShift, what are the features of OpenShift um, once I get the sharing access. Okay, so yeah, um, I would like to understand uh, from from the audience here, how many of you understand uh, OpenShift as a platform or have worked on OpenShift as a platform? You may raise your hands or uh, put it in the chat if you have or you know, just just the reaction hands. Okay, is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so moving, uh, before moving to the lab, let us talk a little about OpenShift. So again, uh, as Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift is again a developing and uh, a platform where you can run your containerized applications. OpenShift is basically built over Kubernetes itself. That means it's nodes, the control plane and the compute nodes uh, in OpenShift cluster. Mm -hmm are built over Kubernetes platform itself as an orchestration tool, uh, um, as to say. Uh, moreover, uh, of course, uh, it's containerized, it's in the cloud, uh, scaling is of course possible. So you start with two nodes, but if your application needs 10 nodes or 20 nodes, scaling to millions of clients is as well possible with OpenShift. And you can deploy it over your cloud, your own single cloud. You can deploy it multi-cloud. When I say multi-cloud, I mean AWS, cloud, Google Cloud. You can have mix of clouds there. And you can deploy it on-premise with, um, it may be on bare metal or on your laptop itself. Now, what is the um, OpenShift container platform life cycle? When I talk about life cycle, I, I start as a user of, of the platform. What all can I do on the on the day one, the day two operations that I, are possible? So first, of course, you create your cluster. Uh, creating your cluster means that you deploy your OpenShift cluster uh, over, over any platform, any environment like we discussed. Then you manage your cluster. Managing your cluster means you, you, know, you have users, you give access to users, or you set up your uh, you know, restrictions or any, any other uh, supporting applications that you feel like deploying, you can do that. Then after that comes the de developing and deploying your applications, which are your user applications. Uh, like for example, I want to deploy Python or as simple as that, right? Or, or Ruby or Java or WebSphere. Any applications that I want to deploy, I can deploy on, on the platform. 
And finally, uh, the scaling up of applications. As I told you that you start from you know, uh, one or two nodes, Further, as the requirement grows, you scale up your applications. Uh, an example here would be the Amazon and the Flipkart, um, the normal days that they have or the peak hours that they have, um, the requirement increases. And then when then they have those uh, sales that come up uh, on 15th of August or you know winter sales and all that. So at that point of time, when millions of users are expected to log into your application, uh, the scaling will all be done automatically, manually, everything is possible on OpenShift. Okay, so maybe before control plane architecture, let me move to the other slide first. Uh, what is a basic OpenShift cluster? Um, what, what does this consist of? As Kubernetes, even here you have control plane and you have compute nodes. Control plane, as we know, it is, is the administrator of your cluster. Everything that has to be done on the cluster, it has to be done through your control plane. We also call it the master. Uh, and what you see in the back, the orange ones, are to maintain the HA availability. So you may have two master nodes, three master nodes are actually suggested by, okay, uh, three master nodes or control planes are suggested by uh, OpenShift as well. On the right, you see are the compute nodes. Now, if you see, I've written core OS here. Uh, when I say core OS, it means the, the platform or the images that are used here are the core operating system images, which are specifically built for containerization. Uh, so, you know, you cannot do anything wrong with that image or that platform here or that virtual machine node, whatever you may call. So as a user, you cannot do anything wrong because these core OS are highly, highly secure uh, images and ensure that the containerization works as expected on your node. Um, so yeah, here I, what I'm showing you is that the control plane and how it is connected to your uh, compute nodes. Now, if I go back, the control plane architecture. So control plane by itself is, is, a, is a normal uh, RHCOS node uh, where you have different services. Now, each and every service that is running on control plane has some, of course, uh, has some uh, purpose. And this is where, uh, this is how control plane controls the entire cluster. So if I talk of Cube API server, it is taking care of all the API requests coming to the control plane. Um, any request that has to reach to the uh, compute node or any anywhere the application, everything is controlled by Cube API server. Coming down to Cube Scheduler, Cube Scheduler manages the scheduling of your applications. What does it mean by scheduling of your applications? Now, if I go ahead and on the cluster, I want to deploy an application. How do I do it? I will go to the cluster uh, on the OpenShift console maybe or through the CLI and I will ask, uh, deploy this application for me. That's all, that's my job. But how Control Plane understands that out of the three compute nodes or the 10 compute nodes, where should I deploy this application, right? It has so many options now. It's not like on-prem, only this machine is there. It has many options. So this is the job of the scheduler to find where to deploy the application. etcd, etcd is um, the configuration part. Anything that you create on your cluster, any configuration that you create on the cluster comes and gets stored in etcd. etcd will have all the control. So tomorrow, if I ask you to uh, take a backup of OpenShift cluster, or if I have to upgrade my OpenShift cluster, what I will do is I'll have my etcd backed up so that if tomorrow something goes wrong, I have everything, every configuration saved as part of my etcd backup. Kubelet is the service for Kubernetes, as we know, it maintains the orchestration and other uh, to and fro of, uh, uh, you know, uh, messages uh, between compute nodes and the control planes. Cryo is another engine, ignition uh, engine for by OpenShift itself, which also ensures that your um, OpenShift platform is able to manage the cluster and the, the control plane and the clusters properly. Okay. User management. So once your cluster is set up, of course, you, you have to log into the cluster. That is the next step. Uh, to work with the cluster, you as a user, you have to get into the cluster. But the, the best part of here is that, uh, which is very different from other platforms, OpenShift does not give you its own users. It will not have its own users. 
only when you are deploying the cluster, when you have uh, installed the cluster, at that point of time, you get one user, which is the cube admin, which is the super user, which can do everything and anything on the cluster. Using this uh, user, you uh, basically start working on the cluster, but you are not uh, suggested to use this particular user for all your operations. Uh, in that case, how do you maintain uh, user authentication and authorization on the cluster? Well, to work with the cluster, to work with OpenShift platform, you use identif uh, uh, sorry, identity providers. What is an identity provider? I will not get into details of all these things, uh, but identity provider is something which creates or you know, holds users like Microsoft Active Directory, um, your, your organization LDAPs, right? Uh, now these, if I talk of IBM itself, IBM has its own repository of users. That's the LDAP. What I can do is I can have IBM's LDAP connected to my OpenShift cluster. And I can use all the existing users on the OpenShift cluster. Again, not all users will have all the accesses. You have restriction on each and every user. Uh, um, you know, if someone is working as a developer in my organization, in my team, though he can log in because he has LDAP access, but on the OpenShift, he will be authorized only to work um, as per the developer rules. So uh, authentication is conducted by LDAP. Authorization is conducted by OpenShift. Um, I hope you all understand, but I'll just give you a quick brief. Authentication means that this user is a valid user of this LDAP connected as an identity provider with OpenShift. Now, uh, it's as like, like, can I enter the restaurant? Yes, you can. That's authentication. But am I authorized to get into the kitchen? Yes or no? Are you a chef? No. In that case, you are not authorized. So authorization is mainly the RBAC, the access controls that you put on, a dif on different users to work on the cluster. And OpenShift does it very, very strongly, very secure. Um, yeah, again, I will not be able to get into all the roles that it has, but OpenShift has cluster level roles. It has project level roles uh, that you can work with. So as per this diagram, I think I've already explained. So you can add your identity provider to the cluster. Uh, OpenShift then registers all those users and grants access control as per as defined. This user then logs into OpenShift platform Okay, sorry, this is repeated here. Authentication is done through the identity provider and further authorization is through your OpenShift platform. Based on the authorization received, your user works on the platform. Okay, now we get on to application deployment. I've got the required access. My cluster is all set up. Now I will be going ahead and deploying the application. The first of all, how Okay, you can deploy your applications through your web, web console, OpenShift web console, or you can deploy your application through the CLI. Whatever mode you choose, it's all the same. But how does, as we were talking about Cube Scheduler, right? It, it schedules an application to be deployed on a particular node. But how does it identify which node should I deploy the application on? The first of all, the first step to identify um, or, or to identify the node out of the 10 nodes is your filtering of nodes. So the cube scheduler gets all the 10 nodes, uh, gets all the information, and then there are some set predicates. It could be like uh, the application needs two GB of space, but only out of the 10, only five who have those, uh, you know, minimum two GB of no space available. So it will filter out those five. Then the pods, um, your application may say that I want to use only node two and three. It's possible, I can select, I can put a node selector while deploying the application. Then in that case, already the filtering is for these two nodes. From these two selected nodes, I then prioritize my nodes. It's actually Cube Scheduler gives scores to each and every node, every predicate that is selected, every filtering that it does. Now, uh, finally, out of the five, which had the space, um, I got two and then I also get a you know, node selector application available. So I'm able to select these two. Then the cube scheduler will prioritize these two. It will give different scores based on, again, its own um, requirements or checklist. And finally, the best fit node will be chosen for application deployment. 
And this is an HA mode. If suppose your node goes down today, if you have a taint, you cannot deploy on one node. Application switches to the other, another node. Your pods are quickly uh, running on the other node and you are good to go. So what you see here is that on the node that you see here, your pods are deployed. So when I'm deploying an application, it is deployed on a node. On the node, the pods are deployed. Now, number of pods will differ. Okay, if it's a basic application with a single node, you will just have one node, uh, one pod. If your application needs, uh, you know, two to three pods, one may be a dependent application. For that, the number of pods will be deployed on that particular node. These pods further have containers. Ideally, you deploy containers only, but then uh, how OpenShift works is, you know, it, it gives you a pod so that you cannot directly interact with the container. Your direct interaction with the container is not allowed. You have to talk to the container through the pod, which is through services um, uh, that you interact. Okay, um, so have we set up our CRC environment? Uh, Ravi, uh, the document was shared. Any update on that? If hey, uh, not sure. Give me a minute. Let me check. Yes, please. yes, please. Yeah, sure. So, uh, do you want the document to be shared with uh, the audience, uh, Hina? Yes, actually, I was expecting that if they could have done the setup because it will take take around 20, 25 minutes. I have done part. Okay. Hina, but, okay. Uh, let me check uh, the rest. Yes, please. I think, Ina, can we do uh, right away here? Like, if you want to just show yeah, it. Yeah, but it takes some time, uh, Ganesh. Uh, yeah, I understand. Like, uh, for me, Docker is already installed on my machine, but we don't need that. I understand we that. Don't need Docker, yes. Docker is no more used by OpenShift yeah. also. But, but apart from that, you said, like, JDK and Maven, all those things are already there. Okay. Okay. And okay. what else you need? Like, because those are the only so, things. Uh, no, basically, um, to run um, OpenShift uh, for our demo purpose today, um, OpenShift provides you a CRC setup, code-ready containers, which you can directly deploy on your um, machine. Oh, that that actually was not their part of PDF. I think that's the reason. Uh, that is yeah. their there uh, that so you basically download the CRC environment and then set up the CRC environment. Uh, maybe right. or yeah. So rather than that, I think I will take you through. Um, yeah, yes, Hina. Yeah. So I'll apparently just try it out. Okay, sure. Uh, so um, till the time you know you uh, the participants go through the CRC download and all. This is the web shift or uh, sorry the open shift web console. So ideally, open shift you can work um, or using the CLI or the open shift web console. Of course, uh, console is the UI uh, for OpenShift platform, much easier to work with, but CLI is quite fast. And if you know the commands and if you are you know, used to run the commands on it, it's, it's fast on the CLI. So many people prefer working with the CLI itself rather than the console, but console is equally good. I will take you through the OpenShift console on uh, how console looks and what all information you can get from the console. So this is a CRC setup. Um, sorry, you will not be able to see. I'll share my screen, uh, just a minute. So here, if you see, uh, this is the uh, CRC download. Uh, so all these steps are actually in the PDF. If uh, I'll, um, Maybe I'll tell the console and then I'll pause for some time and then you can deploy this thing. So once you deploy a CRC setup, 
you get the credentials which are login as administrator or login as a user which is a normal user having just the developer rights so currently what i did i have logged in as a cube admin user as I've told you, Cube Admin is a super user who can do everything on the cluster. Any destruction or any you know negative work that he has to do, he is allowed to do, and that is the reason we um, OpenShift suggests you to delete Cube Admin user once you have created your own cluster admin. So I will go to my cluster. So uh, yeah, if you can see, this is only for development and testing purpose. This is a local uh, setup that we have. And this is just for you know basic basic testing and basic work and for demo purposes as I'm conducting it today. So um, this is the dashboard, OpenShift dashboard, which you see here. Uh, you have the API to connect to uh, the platform. Then you have you know all the versions and other things uh, that the infrastructure needs. Further, you see that all the usage, the resource usage uh, of the cluster are also coming up here. CPU, memory, file system. If your CPU gets above uh, the designated limits, you get errors, you cannot deploy your applications. Um, here on the right, you see the events that are generated. Again, if your CPU goes out of limit, you will get an event here. One of your nodes is down, you get an event here. All these things will be coming um, on this dashboard. So your cluster is all green here. And role plane, I don't know why it's not showing up here. Yeah, uh, someone seeing something? Okay. Uh, next is the operators hub. So now, uh, what OpenShift does is, and why OpenShift is is uh, one of the best, uh, best uh, uh, you know, containerized platform these days is you don't need to deploy your application using all the number of steps that you need. What you can do is that you can directly go to operator hub. So I think it has to be enabled here on, on the platform. But if you go to the uh, operator hub directly, you can just tell it, you know, deploy OpenShift for me or open deploy Python for me, deploy, you know, Liberty for me. It will automatically have all the dependencies deployed by itself on the platform and you will be good to go. You don't need to create any file here like you do in Docker. You have to create a Docker file that, you know, these are the dependencies and this is how I want my application. This will operators take care of all the dependencies that you need. Now we were talking about the nodes. Your nodes come in a compute section of the nodes. Now CRC is a very, very- Ravi, uh, yes. uh, please can you increase that, uh, the point size of page or uh, control okay. plus, plus here. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Good now? Yes, good. Okay, thanks. So what you see here is, only one master worker node because this is a demo environment. If I, in the daily work that I am doing on, on for my applications, I see three master nodes and three worker nodes as the basic requirement. And further that when we scale up our applications, I see more. So anyways, uh, this is compute nodes where you can see all your nodes here. You can check the status of the nodes. You can further check the nodes in details, right? All your, what is, I was talking about the core OS images here, which is again for containerized applications, very secure um, and OpenShift uses uh, core OS for all its master and worker nodes. The YAML files of, you know, what your configuration is, uh, you know, where a lot of details are there. If I want to have some pod selection, I want to put some taints. When, when I say a taint, it actually stops me from deploying any application on this. Um, so I can put all those details here as part of the CML. I can go ahead and I can just change anything I want to. Of course, it has to be right change. It has to be something what OpenShift suggests, and that is how you go for it. Okay. Then logs, uh, you find a problem with the node. You're, you're not able to deploy a node. It, your node is not in healthy state. So we saw here that it is in ready state. What if my node says not ready? What happened? How do I go and check? I have the logs, which will help me check everything on my nodes. Further events, any action that works, anything that you see. So, you know, connectivity was lost probably, and it is now restored. Every application, uh, every event can be checked here. Further, the terminal, uh, you can also get into a node, which is not as simple as, you know, just SSHing. You have to use, uh, uh, you know, your uh, proper core OS files, your, uh, you know, your private key, public key to log into your node. So if I want to get into the terminal, I am allowed to do so. 
so so hina uh, one one question sorry for interruption That's so any yeah. reason to use open shift because most of the functionality has been provided by docker desktop itself right it's like terminal logs config build storage right docker is if i talk of open shift docker is this one thing secondly if i talk of today uh, docker is i think uh, already replaced by podman OpenShift internally uses Podman. So how it is like your OpenShift is a wrapper on Docker. In fact, it's a wrapper on Kubernetes also. So, um, you know, it's it's like you're working with the latest technology when you work with OpenShift. Your edge, if you're working on the edge, you, you use OpenShift. Also updated now, it, it is giving more support in terms of Kubernetes dashboards. Recently, they have updated themselves. And uh, that's why I was asking. That is more pretty much similar to OpenShift now. Okay, so yeah, that that I think we'll have to go get into detail. OpenShift, of course, used Docker before as its base uh, to work on applications and image pulling and all those things. Now it uses Podman. And as far as I'm aware, OpenShift is, is a, a much higher version of Docker today uh, in terms of security, in terms of high availability, uh, and you know other load balancing and all. I think OpenShift uh, is an orchestration platform uh, rather than Docker. So... Yeah, but a good point, yeah, certainly to look into more. Uh, but OpenShift features, I think, should be compared to Docker uh, to understand it better. And this, this Radded OpenShift is, I think, free of cost or it is having a commercial license? It has a commercial license. Um, but yeah, if you want to use it uh, for understanding purpose and all, it does provide you a free trial for 30 days and uh, some platforms like Minikube, Minikube and uh, uh, I think Minikube is for Kubernetes. Uh, it provides you CRC for OpenShift. Yeah. So it's costing is lesser than our uh, Amazon or uh, AWS cloud-based systems where we uh, can manage the same things. They are different. OpenShift will be deployed over AWS. So you can you can uh, provision an AWS uh, uh, cluster a cloud platform and then you can deploy OpenShift over that to use uh, the features. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Sure, Rohit. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on to workload. So uh, as we talked about uh, nodes first, if you remember that diagram, it has nodes, pods, and containers. So we talked about the nodes. So your application gets deployed on this node. So for example, I have one node here. My application gets deployed on this node. When my application is on this node, it means that it has deployed either deployments, uh, if it is not directly deploying the pods. When I talk of deployments, these are some existing deployments. When I talk of deployments, deployments internally deploy your pods. So it's like an application is a deployment, if I can say. Your uh, deployment will deploy your pods. So you check your deployments here. Deployments are all running. You are good. So I come here mm -hmm. and I check my deployments. Uh, what is the state? It is up to date. It is running. I don't see it running here, though. But yeah, to check these deployments, you have these pods. You can check the pods here. It is in running state. Your deployment will also be in running state, by the way. I don't see that here, maybe because of API controls. But your pod, it is in running state. And further, your pod has containers, as we were talking about. So uh, you are not directly allowed to connect to, I mean, you can connect to a container, but as a user, you are not allowed to work on the container. Any changes you want to make to a pod or any uh, Suppose, you know, this deployment, if I see here, it's saying one of one pods. What this means is that my deployment currently has just one occurrence of this, this thing, uh, application. What if I want to have three replicas of my application? Then I can go here in the deployment YAML, I can go and make the change of replicas. Yeah, so if you see here, this is saying replica is equal to one, which means just deploy one pod of my application. I can go and make this as three. I will not do it now. I can do it. It's uh, it's like as easy as this. So when I say this, what happens is that the existing deployment gets edited. Okay, it will now deploy three. Okay, let's try it. So now if I save, this is saved. What will happen is that the existing nodes get terminated, the existing pods get terminated, and my application will now have three running deployments. If I come here, okay, I think this is a machine controller. So what happens is that if you deploy your own application, it will now have three replicas. So when you come here into the workload deployments, you should actually see three of three pods. 
Okay, so when these three of three pods comes, that means that your, if your application one pod goes down due to some problem, um, uh, you know, um, it lost connectivity or or some reason the pod goes down, but your application for the end user does not go down. Your Amazon never goes down. Why? Because it has replication activated. Okay. So uh, from the pods, you have containers. So your containers are expected to work. When you see here, you have this container working, uh, this pod working, and you can go to logs and see what is it saying in the logs. Okay. Now, if I come to the YAML of the pods, so I'm on the pod now. I'm on the YAML of the, it's all YAML based. All your deployments, everything is YAML based. Even when I'm deploying anything through my UI, it's actually creating a YAML in itself. Yeah, but now here one, hello. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, see like node has a pod, pod mm -hmm. has a container. Okay, so in typically, is there any calculation like, uh, one uh, one node can contain this many pods or one pod contain this many container and in a container there are services so is there any uh, high level logic like one container have a five services or four services something is there is there a calculation there so basically containers as such do not have services services are ideally used to talk from container to pod pod to your uh, you know, um, maybe the external user who is, if, if I open an application, I'm basically talking through a service. I get a route. So I get that route. Using that route, I connect to the pods. And then these pods, so you have internal IPs and those are the services that you are using. Container to container interaction will be again through services. Pod to container interaction will again be through services. So um, I don't have that diagram with me, but yes, you have that uh, defined thing that one node can probably have around 200 pods. That's the limit uh, for container. Pods again can have as number of containers. Pods, I, I don't think have any limitation on containers. Uh, they can have many number of containers within uh, themselves and each of them talk through each other through services. That is the job of services. That is the role of services to enable the interaction between pod containers, container to container, pod to pod, again, node to node. So all these interactions are based on the services. Okay, but in typical microservices architecture, like, okay, because nowadays every project are micro, microservices yeah. architecture based. So in that yeah. case, like, <clears throat> means like for every module, like even in a single project, different module has its own services and its own database, correct? So yeah, while yeah. interacting with different, different models, we have to interact with services. Services, so, exactly. So in that case, is it like that in microservice architecture for one module, you will have that, node pod and container structure like means every module has something like that uh no typical I... or typical for one project miss or maybe i wanted to understand uh like for two models two models because hmm. the models that now in my microsoft architecture they see you know the clients are preferring a different vendor like one model developed by one vendor vendor partner and second model by second okay like right. charging is done by some other partner and the onboarding done by some other partner so at that time right. so whether uh so they will create their own nodes ports on because obviously all code has to be deployed on the open shift like for a for a client so okay. in that case they are using the different different nodes or, port, or single node single node pod and container whatever the architecture is there that is mm -hmm. shared by all the modules or maybe all the vendors in the end so it, it depends on how you develop an application. If you want to keep different modules onto different pods, even that is, that also works. Again, interaction uh, through these will be is as good as the normal interaction that you have for services. It depends on how you are developing your product. If you want to have it on different containers, it will be on different containers and they should be able to interact with each other. So the work of the service is to give and take the data, right? Or, or the, you, know, you, you take your instructions and get back the response. So that is as good as how you develop it. So yeah, but internally in the con container, you don't have services. It's like your, your containers will be talking to another container or to the pod with those services. So if you are deploying your modules on different containers, it will work accordingly. Okay, but the way you say, right? How the replications happen is what is the trigger point? The way you said Amazon never gone down because 
they mm. have their replication so where that logic is uh, like see how in jenkins like a orchestrator which has a uh, which has a, a pipeline logic like okay after completing this job go to this or or we can code that like that okay, okay after completing this job okay, go to next job next right. job or if it is if, if else condition kind of thing and we can execute that pipeline in the jenkins Mm -hmm. But here the replication part, like okay, because that pod is going down, or maybe I don't know because mm -hmm. of what reason. But mm -hmm. how the replication? Me, what is the trigger point to replicate uh, the the pod? No, so replicas. Right? If I say three replicas, that means I will always have three uh, instances of that application running. Right, and when I say application, it means the overall application with all its containers are running. That is what three replicas means. Now it could be see what I currently did was a manual scaling of it. I said you keep three ap applications or three instances of the application always running. OpenShift also provisions auto auto scaling. When I say auto scaling, it means that whenever you know uh, uh, user so when I have three replicas running and uh, uh, you know user tries to access say 10 users try to access, it will be the job of the load balancer to ensure that, you know, which instance of the application the user can work with. Now, if I do auto scaling of this application, which means that I will give only one or two replicas initially, but later if, you know, instead of 10 users as expected, it is hundred users now. The two app, the instances are overloaded. What it does is auto scaling will actually increase the number of pods automatically yeah. to ensure that all the hundred users are now addressed to. No user got, faces yeah. the uh, you know issue with the application working. Yeah, I got it. I think yeah, I think I missed that logic. Yeah, you are right. right. So I get that load balancer, load balancer will take care of that. Okay, means up to certain extent, his port structure will work. But if if right. the load is going above that limit, then auto scale has a new to and it will create. So that yeah. that that is the trigger point or to create a replication. I I got it. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. So here, what you saw is that uh, this pod. Where did we see that? Okay. Now this pod has seven on seven. This means that there are seven containers within this particular pod. Okay. Now these containers are, are deployed as per uh, your, you know, and how you have planned and how they have created. But one pod here is containing of seven containers. And to check that, what you can do is go to the pod YAML. Pod YAML will have the containers list. What all containers are there? big one yeah so if you see these are the containers here it will tell you what is the limit how many what you know what uh how what sorry what request can the container make for the cpu and the memory resources and further you can also define that this is the limit for the container to define a cpu or a memory again these are the services on the path where you can uh, access this particular container all these are certain features. And what I was trying to show you that, that you have seven containers within this YAML now. Each container will have its own container ID and it will have its own you know, um, reference path or port where you can access that particular container, right? So you have the ports here. Um, and you know, if you want to deploy, each container has a different image. If you want to deploy it with different images, you can deploy it. Okay, uh, so yeah, secrets we know that we use for um, um, authentication purpose at times. You use secrets for uh, even building your application. So what you see here are the secrets created by OpenShift itself uh, to create different, um, you know, uh, different parts of our configurations in the system. Okay, uh, then what? So yeah, user management we spoke of. I'd like to show you the different roles and all on the user management. Sorry, I, Hina, uh, yeah. do we have any mechanism here? Like uh, in terms of uh, if something went wrong, like uh, mm -hmm. in the board, uh, will it able to send us notification? Uh, something like uh, CloudWatch or some sort of that? So see, uh, basically for logging and monitoring, you have um, uh, Prometheus and Grafana already integrated with OpenShift. Okay, so yeah. that is one thing where you can easily see, you know, your dashboard tells you pod is available, not available. Um, so basically you, you come to know here that these are, there are 71 pods in this inventory. And if there is something wrong, you will get like two not available or, and you have different messages. 
um, you know, if, if the image was not pulled correctly for the pod, you'll get a different message. Then you have events. So I can actually log into the CLI to see, you know, what, uh, what logs I can see, um, what events I can see. But yes, you have a lot of mechanisms on OpenShift to find it. It's quite easy to find what the problem is. If at all, can it's a big with Those events, like uh, if this event occur, it will send us uh, email notification. Uh, that configuration can be done um, and we've not done it uh, but the normal is the events notification that we see on the dashboard itself okay mm -hmm. yeah you know one more i uh, maybe this is a uh, um silly question or maybe i'm um, based on my half knowledge i'm asking mm -hmm. but now here the way like uh, node pod and uh, container architecture is uh, is it not related to our uh, the um, release branch and the main branch, the strategy, right? Both are different. Is my understanding correct? They are different, yes. Yeah. 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 So Node is basically your um, virtual machine, if you say. Yeah, On the correct. virtual machine, you are deploying your application, uh, which is in the form of pods now. Uh, deployments or you call deployments deployments will have pods so uh, the way the things are getting uh, so how your virtual machine works is different of course and how your virtualization is working is different but if i talk of uh, you know uh, a general language it is uh, a node is a virtual machine on which you deploy your applications it's like that yeah correct True. yes mm -hmm. Okay, uh, storage is again storage classes that you want to um, you know integrate with OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift itself has uh, uh, OpenShift container storage, uh, OCS. Um, it's ODF now, and you can use uh, normal block storage, file storage, uh, you know anything you want. But yeah, normally we are now going with the block storage, which is ODF, which OpenShift itself provides. So you can actually integrate that uh, storage class with it, so that what you can create your volumes um you know and start working with your application uh, using those volumes so this is what it is about i was going to user management because i was going to talk about different roles so if you see openshift by default provides you many many roles these roles are in uh, cluster level roles like for the whole cluster if you want to work on something or these are project level roles uh, and project is a namespace, as you know, in Linux. So project is OpenShift, you know, it gives you an area to work with for your application. Your application deploys in that area. And that is why it's project. And that is how you can secure your application. So uh, these are the roles that you have. Uh, then the users, like we created, I showed, I've shown you this, right? Um, when CRC got deployed, it had two users created. So these are the users that you can see here. These users get a particular role. So if you see, uh, okay, they have not given any role binding, but yeah, you can give a role binding to these users. Um, just to give a binding, you can give the roles here. Um, what role do you want to, you know, you make him um, admin role or a basic user who just have read access to your application or to the cluster, all these uh, bindings. So this is the authorization part that I was talking about. Now here, these two users are given to you by CRC, but you cannot create a new user on your platform now. To create a new user, you have to integrate external identity provider like LDAP, HT password is another one, which is a very common one, which you can use. Okay, uh, Ravi, any update on the uh, access to CRC environment? Uh, I don't have an update on that. Uh, I've shared okay the setup file with the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we should continue on this. Uh, you know, like okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes, I'm. I'm almost done with the console part. Uh, maybe I can talk about the projects. Uh, so this is a project. So I can create a new say test under go as for demo project here. Give a display name and all. Now, sorry. So basically test demo. So you can create a new project. Now, whatever applications I want to deploy, I can directly go and deploy in this test demo project. So um, yeah, so I think yeah, the uh, hub, this uh, operator hub is not enabled here. Otherwise I could have told you how to deploy it. So um, you can deploy applications directly in the test demo and then whatever work you do, you do in your own project. You delete the application, you scale the application, you create the service or routes or whatever. It has to be in that particular project. Yes, um, uh, Ravi, I am done with the um, um, 
the basic parts of, of my this thing. But for lab, I need access. So you know, when you say access, uh, access uh, means uh, access from uh, team ATA. No, 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 no. So, the, okay. so the users need to have some access, um, Ravi. I think. Uh, or I, maybe I can do one thing, uh, Ravi. I can um, uh, may later maybe just put some commands and uh, you know some commands on steps on how to deploy the application and then uh, participate. I think that, later. that would be right enough. Uh, yes. Because you know, like I just noticed, uh, even though I'm having a, it needs RAM of nine GB itself. It, this is what I noticed. Oh, okay. Okay. So I am already having 8 GB RAM available. I thought with 8 GB it would go ahead, but it is not going. I have hard disks available. A lot of hard disks is available. I was trying to do that setup, but then I it's see the limitation is there. Yes. And users will also need to have uh, admin access and Hyper-V enabled for... Yeah, uh, that, that is there actually. That that yeah. was not an issue for me because I have done that already through BIOS. Okay. okay but sure. then this thing is actually, uh, as Docker was there actually for me. You know that that precondition would occur itself on Windows machine. So that's the limitation. Otherwise, I would have been ready by this time. But yeah. the approach which you discussed, yeah. let's go ahead with that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sure. So I'll, I'll share this with you by tomorrow. Um, I'll just try to put some screenshots and all the commands, and then you know users can try that deployment. Maybe yes, using yes, the yes, test try. Yeah. Open oh. is you know like really uh, really important to have a knowledge about it. Everyone I mean should aware about it because yeah. these days no one is asking. Do you know Kubernetes and Docker or the configuration related related to that? But right. then they're asking, are you aware of OpenShift? Yes. So OpenShift demo. nowadays is being used by almost all uh, the platforms, yeah. and all the customers also. OpenShift has a wide and it's, it's growing above Kubernetes and Docker, of course, because of the features that it provides. Um, so yes, something to something to really, really know about. Yes. But, you know, Robert, uh, what this question is okay from the mindset of uh, means from the uh, okay from the mindset of a tester who wants to learn okay about uh, uh, about uh, these things be it Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift, or uh, any okay other such okay technologies. How should they approach? Because uh, because now we know that okay uh, from Docker okay now things are going to uh, something else now we're like we're moving ahead. Yes. So should they focus on Docker or should focus on uh, the uh, some other okay uh, tech stack okay. as per the needs and how they should approach it. So consider okay they are like uh, they don't have any information on okay on on these topics or tech stack. What mm -hmm. should be their mindset and attitude to approach that? Okay, the first approach is Docker. Because Docker tells you what is a container. Docker tells you what are images. Docker tells you how to create the Docker files. Um, Docker tells you how containerization works. The first thing that you want to know. On top of Doc Docker, you can actually go to OpenShift directly. Uh, Kubernetes is good to know. Um, so I'm a CKD, I'm a certified Kubernetes developer. So uh, it is good to know Kubernetes because then you understand, okay, what is Kubelet and what is Kube API server? The services are the same if you if you have a knowledge of Kube, uh, Kubernetes. So Docker is the first step, of course, to understand Kubernetes. Further, OpenShift is the technology that is now uh, everyone is moving to. Uh, so, you know, OpenShift... Uh, uh, all your, if I have a talk of IBM, the new, all the new products that they are building is on top of OpenShift. Uh, the new, the other customers, even Amazon, I think is, has started using OpenShift. So uh, customers are moving to OpenShift now. And that's the reason where you move to the latest technology, um, where Edge is supported or, you know, any, any latest technologies are supported on OpenShift. How to go for it? Udemy uh, is, is one thing uh, to go. And I think it's very important if you are working in cloud, uh, and you don't know about Kubernetes or OpenShift, it's something, uh, and if you wish to go into cloud, I think that's the first step. If you wish to get into something which is cloud-based, you have to know Docker, you have to know Kubernetes, OpenShift, start from Udemy, uh, or really has some good trainings uh, provided. Then they have these certifications. So if I talk of OpenShift certification, the first certification that OpenShift gives you, the base certification is 180, which is Docker and uh, you know working on with configurations and docker configurations and all that so go for these certifications that will give you a and these are all um, hands on certifications like say ckad 
you cannot just pass them if with the basic theoretical knowledge. So go for certifications. I think that's a good first step. Um, D0182, 180, 280. Then for Kubernetes, you have uh, CK80. That's the first uh, thing. So yes, that's how you can. And, and uh, yeah. you know, like today, like when we see, okay, uh, today we, when we see the, uh, the testing, uh, like how we see the testers. So yeah. maybe like put into, you are like a backend tester, you, you are a front-end tester. And mm -hmm. okay, like uh, like when, when it comes to the front end, say let's say tester, they'll be on a uh, let's say web page or web applications, mobile apps, and something um, that will that will uh, okay, that will the end user will uh, consume. Correct. So, all right. Now, uh, how should okay how should okay this uh, this set of testers should also uh, develop okay that mindset. Now I should also get into okay the back end. Uh, mm -hmm. If I have to test, okay, the front end very well because because I should know very well, okay, what happens when I make a request from front end, right? right? And not just that, today, like when we are hosting, okay, our service on all such containers and platform, uh, even they should be aware of it. So, what would you say uh, to we test engineers, okay, who label ourselves as the front end, the front end engineers and the back end engineers? Okay, so see, uh, if you really want to be an SME in one type of testing, then it's a different thing. Like, you know, but even if I'm a front end SME in testing, okay, and I open a, a basic uh, defect that, you know, uh, when I click this button, it, it's not clicking. Today, developers are also expecting you to understand why am I not able to click that button? Okay, it's as simple as that. The related API is not giving me response from the backend. So when I click the button, I don't get anything. You be a backend tester, you be a front end tester, you become you know database tester. Understanding the end to end flow of the application has to be there. Uh, you know, gone are the days when tester was like you know oh, it's not working. I see error and open a defect. No one, no one appreciates that now. As a tester, I have to be better than a developer. And this has been my learning, uh, you know, in, in these two decades of this thing that I really have to be better than my developers. At times, developers do not un even understand, you know, uh, what is this functionality about? Developers have no idea of what customer will be doing. They get a requirement, they code the requirement and give it to you. Everything is the onus is on the testers. So front end to back end, everything you have to know. Uh, how to know is of course on you. Uh, talk to your developers, talk to architects in your team, understand, get that uh, block diagram of your application. How many testers do that? Uh, you know, if you don't do that, of course you are at the back seat. If you have to be a good tester, start looking into the architecture diagram of your product. Even, uh, in fact, now what we have also started is that asking our teams, our, our testing teams, to check the CRs that have been checked in uh, by the developers. So we also check in the code that the developers are checking in. What if else and where could a possibly a fault be there and where can we catch that bug? Um, right. So, yes, I think front end, back end, it's all has to so be known. Yes. And and uh, one more thing, you know, what I say is the machine. Okay, uh, usually what we get, okay, uh, let's mm -hmm. say uh, the test engines, it could be like max of uh, 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 like a uh, two core or like four core machines, and with uh, with RAM of eight GB. So when we run, okay, search, okay, uh, uh, search uh, tech stacks of system, again, uh, that goes means uh, it won't scale probably or uh, it it won't perform well, right? So. Uh, what would be your advice, okay, to test engineers, okay, mm -hmm. uh, on the machine configuration, okay, they should have, okay, uh, to have this setup on their um, on their machine, be it on be it on their personal machine or or the work machine. What should be the minimum configuration so that okay, at least they can uh, do the setup and practice, and then okay, let's think about the project works. Okay, that's a tough question, <laughs> Ravi. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, 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 because I go through this, uh, because I went through this a lot of time. Uh, like, uh, like for example, when I have to enable, okay, the Hyper-V on a machine. So then again, it comes, okay, it comes, like, is it Intel or something else? Then again, mm -hmm. the bio setups. Like, it is like, like uh, yeah. 
you know what yes. I Yeah, yeah, I understand. So this actually depends on the application that you're doing, right? The um, for us, you know, um, I'll give you a very small example, not related to testing. Uh, I was using my Mac, which was uh, having two CPU uh, cores. So when the WebEx application that we use in our day-to-day -day work uh, in IBM, um, it got updated. It used four cores uh, for camera sharing and, you know, uh, to change your virtual backgrounds. So uh, then we had to request and go back, okay, we need a machine with four cores. We are not able to work with this. So that you know every application will have its own requirement and i think uh, if you are using openshift you need to have a minimum of 32 gb ram uh, that yeah. we all have uh, otherwise it's very difficult to scale up your applications yeah. uh, you know and to use big applications on that front other than that of course based on the application you have to check your setup and uh, go with that uh, that uh, <laughs> that is something yeah. that and i think uh, these days almost all the app all the big platforms are providing you, uh, you can go for AWS one year uh, free subscription also. Just provision any size of VM you want and start working your, uh, uh, practice your uh, things there. Yeah, but the trouble there is, they say to had okay, that um, debit card or credit card. And the worry is, what if I something like by mistake, if I wash out okay, some, the, the box size or so size and it start consuming. So that's a, <laughs> that's a concern that's part. One year. <laughs> Within yeah. one year, Within one year, they don't charge you anything. Okay. Uh, go to, in fact, if you, if you're doing AWS training also, you know, you will have to provision one year uh, AWS okay. subscription. It's very easy to go and uh, provision your virtual machines there, uh, start deploying whatever application you want and work on that. If at all something has to be charged, they let you know beforehand. And if it is minimal, pay for it and go ahead. <laughs> And there is so, uh, it is learning. I think you have to invest a little on yourself. Yeah, and there is so okay. This one more uh, the sort of confusion path for okay, uh, test engineers. Like uh, when we when we talk about okay, this tech stacks. So um, the idea what uh, that runs in the mind is okay. This is something uh, to do with the DevOps. Now should I uh, stop testing and go to DevOps? So. So that is the mindset, okay, or that is the question I get when I talk to, okay, uh, uh, the engineers in community. But I say, you know, today there is no uh, such, uh, like, a, uh, no such difference between, okay, uh, I do testing or DevOps. But there is a difference, okay, in the role. But uh, as overall, being a test engineer, uh, I say, we should know the things, how even the DevOps functions. So yes. what would be your advice, okay, for a tester? Okay, one who gets into this confusion thoughts? No. That is DevOps, and I don't want to go there. Yeah. So, Ravi, see, if you want to stay in your own area, okay, but uh, in testing, say, right? And I ask you, Ravi, uh, please go and uh, ensure that your testing is uh, into the CDCI pipeline. What will you do? Yes. I'm not talking about DevOps. I'm not talking about no, developers. Yes. I'm talking about the testing code, automation code. Right. So there is something we should all do. CICD. We should all do it, right? So, yeah. that's where, that is why the 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 hard lines initially when i had joined uh, uh, one of my companies and you know they they, they told me you know there is a chinese wall between the development and the testing team so you are not allowed to go and talk to the testing team on any bugs or anything you have to report your bugs and only in formal calls you do that but when after agile has come these days i have to work with the development hand in hand to ensure that any bug that is found comes to a conclusion it gets fixed, it gets the priority, it gets the customer importance, impact and all that. Similarly, DevOps, so now we have a new term if you've heard of it, it's testing ops. Testing ops, yes, test ops. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it's a combination of your testing and DevOps. Right. Testing, is, yeah. I think more than development, more than DevOps, testing is, is the one which is holding the pillars now. So uh, you have to know how things are working, Ravi. I mean, yeah. uh, to yeah. add upon that, uh, we also have, we have now uh, SRE. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, cycle engineering. Yeah. It's again uh, the operations management again. Mm -hmm. this, yes. This old role of you know operations and all it's now merged into SRE. SRE so SRE, SRE yes. will talk to us and then you go ahead and yes, this is a way to give roles and every role has its boundaries of course. Like as a tester, I will not go and fix the bug. But as a tester, I will work with the development to get the bug fixed. I will yeah. help them, okay, this is where I think the problem is. Um, I should be able to you know, find that API, which is the problem. I should be able to see this API is giving me 404. That means it's some problem with the server connectivity. 
401 authentication so you know i should be that fast as a tester right. reach yes. out to my development team yes i heard that so rohit you have raised uh, raised hand so please uh, turn on your camera or unmute yourself and go ahead rohit yeah so hina just i want to know that uh, is there any uh, disaster recovery right. mechanism available with open shift yes yes rohit so dr mechanisms are available um and uh, ha ha is one of that um, the feature itself where you have so you have three masters uh, or three uh, control planes in compute nodes also as i told you if one node goes down the other two quickly take up so similarly you can deploy your clusters accordingly and uh, the dr mechanism can take place between two clusters also okay yeah okay uh um, if you have questions, okay, we can turn on camera and uh, unmute ourselves, and uh, we can ask the questions to Hina. Okay. So, Hina, so how good is the support of the community? How good is the support of the community? It is very good. Red Hat has uh, its own community. Uh, they have their own support system as well. You can, you know, uh, any question you have, put it on the community. Any, any sort of even certification related, as small as certification related, or as good as you know something with the cluster problem with the cluster, you can reach out to the Red Hat community. Uh, plus, uh, the support team is of course there. It's, it's a twenty-four by seven and uh, a good support system. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, I have this question for you. Okay, again, this is okay question okay, that I get uh, from the stages. So I ask you. So mm -hmm. when I uh, start practicing uh, on Docker, okay, mm -hmm. I mean, I can use uh, uh, the Docker images and run okay, them with my test, uh, like what I do. But uh, mm -hmm. how to okay, uh, practice in Kubernetes? For a test engineer, because okay, I see sometimes okay there is no need for me uh, uh, to run uh, to, to run on a, on cube, but if uh, the one way is for me okay to go, uh, to go to backend and see how this uh, uh, the cube is okay uh, maintaining and and it's talking to pods, I can do that and I can see the logs and and do it all with okay, with the help of this, uh, with the help of this cube. Other than that, how can I approach? learning of uh, the kubernetes again for learning um, ravi um, trainings a lot of trainings are there for kubernetes if you have to learn and to work on your own system it provides you mini cube cluster uh, you can deploy that on your machine i was able to deploy it on my machine uh, i think you have to check the resources and all the requirements uh, if your machine suffices that but yeah uh, it should be possible to deploy mini cube and start working on the cluster. Use any training. Udemy has very good trainings, uh, which I have personally done. And uh, just go ahead with that, and um, you learn it, and then get yourself certified uh, in the certifications that Kubernetes provides, and you are good to go on Kubernetes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was this the question, or I will rephrase the question. I, I will rephrase the question. So. Uh, uh, I have a team of uh, okay, uh, test engineers mm -hmm. who say, okay, now we run our test using uh, the Docker images, like which we make use and okay, we spin up and we run test. Now, uh, one way of learning, okay, uh, how to use Kubernetes and like how to deploy and how to how to manage uh, the communication and network between the spots here. Yeah. That thing, okay, we, we practice like uh, talking to the DevOps team or we do it ourselves. So, um, so the question what I get is, okay, how can we uh, use this in our, uh, in, in our testing? Like for example, uh, for testing, okay, what we do in automation, we, we, we use uh, the Docker uh, containers and images, we do that. But we haven't got to an extent that, okay, we also can use Kubernetes. So even I'm not sure, okay, how to bring in that uh, to help my testing. Sometimes I feel, okay, that's too much if you bring in. So I- So uh, Kubernetes is open source, right, Ravi? Right. Kubernetes yes. is open source. Start with your deployment of the basic cluster, and then whatever you're doing with Docker, um, start migrating it to Kubernetes. So the images that you have created for Docker, you can use the same images to create your pods here. Pods, yes. Yeah, yes. so 
it will be an exercise, but then yeah, uh, I think yeah. Uh, it could be. So, yeah, we are trying to do that. Yes. Ravi, uh, Ravi yes, how how we do did in our projects? If you let me know, I can tell you. Uh, okay. What you can do, let's say, if you have a front end, back end, okay, two different services are there, two different basically projects. Let's say front end is one, back end is one. One is with database, right? Right. So, uh, most of the teams, what they did, they will take an automation box as a separate box where right. we deploy our images, and on that automation, we will write our automation docker scripts right yes so instead of that what you can do you can deploy every service individually on your automation box yes. okay uh, service one service two service three and as hina suggested instead of docker now our automation will also run as a kubernetes pod there yeah right. so yeah you will get lot that I could on, yeah. Uh, yeah you will get a lot of tutorials yeah. on youtube i also learned similarly yeah so yeah. we can get it Yes, yes, we are trying to do that now. You know, we start with the small thing and then you know, things, yeah. cascade to the bigger ones. So, yeah. So why we're trying to do this so that okay, uh, there is no need for there is no no need in the project. But we are doing it uh, so that okay, we can upskill the team as well. So my, my team members, so that be they be aware of these right. things. I mean. I think yeah, Kubernetes cluster can be deployed. Pick up some applications which can be deployed on Kubernetes, and uh, um, you know all commands and YouTube, Udemy will help you deploy those applications. And eventually, you can get your own images that you have for your application deployed on Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Ideally, so, Kubernetes uh, is using Docker. I'm sorry, Kubernetes is using Docker as as the base thing, so right. it should be same. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, any questions from audience to Hino? Yeah, one interesting question. Yes, Shailendra. So, how many days you have been into this open shift and Kubernetes? Uh, I mean to say you reached up to the, some certain level of uh, competency in this field, right? So someone has to start new. Uh, that will be some reference for us. Right. So Shailendra, I have been here. I've been. Uh, I've started with open shift first. Uh, I was directly put into an OpenShift project where we started working on uh, the application deployments and and it's very interesting to be very true and you know that's where I got the interest for OpenShift since it was also using uh, Docker before so um, I got a chance to upskill myself on Docker upskilling was my on my own. Um, and it was again through YouTube um, because we had Docker and we had all those uh, facilities in the project itself. So I didn't have uh, problems in you know uh, using these application using these platforms. So referring to uh, you know Udemy courses, um, then I went for Kubernetes. After Docker, I, I went for Kubernetes, where I did my certifications on Kubernetes. Um, and uh, OpenShift was anyways going hand in hand for the project work that I was working on. And uh, and along with that, Kubernetes become impo becomes important because then only you understand how these services are working for uh, in OpenShift also. So uh, the first step, as I've told you, start with Docker, uh, because even if you start with OpenShift or Kubernetes today, Docker learning has to be there. Um, go for uh, Udemy has when I when I talk of Udemy, uh, Udemy again and again, it's because it has some courses which are very well defined. They will take you step by step. So choose for, um, I'm not getting his name currently. So um, I'll, I'll tell you the trainer also. I think everyone would know also um, Muhammad or something. I, I'm not getting the name uh, as a well. cloud. It's a core cloud. Yes, correct. So okay. if you go for that training, uh, it covers end to end each and everything. They explain you, they have their own labs also. So Ravi, one thing for you as well. Uh, if you go for Udemy training, they have their own labs. So you don't need to set up anything. In fact, they will ask you to set up Minikube also if you wish to, else you can use their setup. So you just have to use that API and uh, you know URL and connect to their lab directly. So all that effort of your environment and all that resource availability will, will go away. So use that training. Um, it will, it's a very good guide. It prepares you for certifications. It has exercises, labs, everything is there. Uh, you will get very good hands-on doing that. And then you get some ideas also on how you can utilize that training in your own project as well. Yes. yes okay. Thank you. And one more question. Like you mentioned that uh, uh, OpenShift does have one trial uh, license for 30 yes. days. So there, there isn't any uh, open source uh, uh, version as such instead of 30 days restriction period? 
So they have mm -hmm. CRC. Yeah, I will share. I have already, sh I had shared that document um, uh, with the other team, but I think uh, uh, what I'll do is that I'll reshare that, uh, that particular document on how to download that OpenShift local. It is called Code Ready Containers, CRC in the short form, uh, that you can set up on your own local machine. Yeah, I, I, I had that set up already done. So uh, maybe next step, uh, there would be some set of commands I need to run. Maybe, yeah, maybe you, Hina, are, Hina, you are speaking on mute, mute, but then uh, we are having a time check here. We need to go back to the main session because Adi and all are waiting for us over there. Maybe Shailendra, you can get back to Hina afterwards, or then you can answer to Shailendra's query on uh, the main chat window in the main, main session, I mean to say. Yeah. Sure, Ritu. Sorry yes. to interrupt, but yeah, we have a time yeah. check here. Thank and you. it was great okay. interacting with everyone here. Yeah, here. thank you. Thank you, Inam. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you for that. Thank you. But here, yeah. so uh, Vasita, yeah, please do, let's do the poll of thanks. To, and uh, yeah, we'll, um, we'll have an announcement that uh, let's, after this, okay, what of thanks, let's move to the main track. There we have a quiz and uh, there is one. Okay, come, let's uh, uh, testing, testing, uh, Leadership Award, okay, is being presented, and that's something, okay, what we should watch, yeah, in my opinion. Um, yes, Ashita, to you now. Thank yeah. you, Hina. Thank you. Thank you, Hina, for the wonderful session. I would request the audience.